Thank you very much to the Vatikuti Foundation, uh, Professor Bhandari and, and Raj Vatikuti here for the kind invitation. I took over as the chairman of the Department of Urology at the University of Miami about two and a half years back. And obviously, one of the major tasks be, after being a chair is to take care of your faculty and your research. And you can't do anything without sound data. Well, the University of Miami published so many papers in urology that I just assumed that this was all built in. They were all data databases that were functional and great. And then I realized how primitive they were. And, uh, and it gave me a severe headache because, believe it or not, to actually maintain good data requires an incredible amount of money and resources. And I did not have either of them. And thanks to the very generous uh, gift by the Water Equity Foundation, we were able to get started on both counts uh, over the last couple of years, and actually well on our way, and the results of this will be phenomenal down the line. So thank you very much uh, for the kind support. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, most of the urologists and the non-urologists uh, to come for our meeting. We are doing a meeting on robotic surgery and urology oncology in Miami Beach in May 13th and 14th, so all of you are invited. Uh, <clears throat> so how much data does our industry produce as such? In 2011, the U.S. healthcare system reached 150 exabytes of data. I did not even know that there was a word called exabyte. And now this is projected to grow towards a zettabyte. You can do the math by, by, by doing the calculation about what that means. To me, what this means is that five exabytes would contain all the words ever spoken by human beings on the earth. So just assume the amount of data we have in terms of the vocabulary that we use. Now, what kind of data do we normally produce in healthcare industry? In healthcare industry, the data that we are producing is predominantly in text and numbers. Why is healthcare data considered a big data? Because of the following reasons. The volume. Just even at rest, we have terabytes to exabytes worth of data that we collect in the healthcare industry. Uh, I don't know the penetration of electronic medical records in India, but I can tell you in the United States, Almost very little of what I do is in a written format. Almost everything is in electronic format. We have very high velocity, active, dynamic data in healthcare. Because think about it, a patient comes to you, you see a patient, you're writing the notes about the point of care. He then gets a urine analysis that is fed in the computer. He then goes to get a CAT scan done. Uh, the information of that is fed there. The images are fed there. So your visual data, your text data, being exchanged in and out every single time, every single minute. We have a very wide variety of data. Because of the different types of data, we have numerical values in terms of the lab values. We have imaging data, which are pictorial. And obviously, we have text data. And then the veracity of the doubt of the data, because it's very inconsistent. And a lot of times, it's incomplete, because it's being fed by a variety of people. Not one person is in control of feeding data in the healthcare system. So it's a very, very complex environment. Now, it is projected that 80% of data produced in the healthcare industry is unstructured or uncertain, and this will have a huge impact on analysis. In fact, for any of you who have an entrepreneurial bent of mind, this is your way to make billions of dollars. The, the US has moved towards ele electronic medical records. If you can figure out a way from the time the patient comes to the office to convert or transform that data into analyzable data for research, for outcomes, for insurance companies, for so on and so forth, that's a sure shot winner. The problem is, at least as of now, there's no one technology that is able to do everything uh, in this direction. But I'm sure uh, Raj, with his technology mind, will come out with something in the near future. Now, Things can go right when you get good data, and things can go wrong. Uh, for example, this was horribly wrong. Uh, these were the Google flu trends uh, that were fed because of inappropriate data or incomplete data, and they overestimated the Christmas flu by about 50%. That's a huge miss. At the same time, there were cholera outbreaks in Haiti after the earthquake, where because of the social media and the inputting of the right data, 
everyone was on target in terms of estimation of the damage and then ways to control this damage. Now, quality data has a huge impact prospectively in patient care as well. Uh, this is the Artemis project in the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Where they do is in the neonatal ICUs, instead of the nurses uh, just taking the vital signs and just a few data points being there, they found a system where every single parameter that they could evaluate in a continuous monitoring fashion, they did evaluate. And then they came out with an analytical model where any neonate with sepsis could be very reliably forecasted 24 hours earlier. So imagine if you have the ability of, of predicting that this child will develop sepsis in 24 hours and you're able to implement uh, precautionary measures or prophylactic measures or antibiotics in that time frame, imagine the amount of damage that you can curtail with this type of, type of technology. Again, quality data has a huge impact on population health. Uh, the only problem, as I mentioned, is the way you analyze it. Uh, NHS, for example, has plans to get gen genomic sequencing in more than 100,000 cancer patients. This is in this pilot phase. Uh, we will have the data in 2017. And with this inordinate amount of data, this will lend itself to several future drug development and therapeutic pathways uh, just because of the sheer uh, the volume of data and the quality of data. Uh, impact on quality research, uh, this is a very good example. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges in clinical trials is accrual. People have tried several means of increasing accruals uh, to patients in, quality, uh, in, uh, in clinical trials in order to get the highest quality of data. However, you can actually use technology where if you have a certain amount of natural language processing and you, and you make the machine learn, it can actually give you a prompt for eligibility for clinical trials. So for example, let's say if I want to do a clinical trial on a patient with prostate cancer and active surveillance. Every time, if I'm writing on the medical record of that patient about active surveillance, this, the computer will take all this data, and at the end of my note will alert me that Dr. Parekh, this patient may be a trial, may be a candidate for accrual in an active surveillance trial. And that way you can increase the accrual. Uh, in the patient care, again, uh, the same thing that I just told you about accrual in clinical trials, it's a very, very commonly used model now to prevent medication-related errors. Uh, how many of you have ever used electronic medical system in your day-to-day -day life in this audience? There's very few. It's still a minority. It's very common now, for example, if you would prescribe an antibiotic and the, and the data set, the patient's medical record system, already has a list of other medications that this patient is on, and let's say if there's an interaction be between the medication that you are giving and the medication that the patient is receiving, you will not be allowed to complete that order. You'll have to override the order, call the pharmacy. There are several checks and balances that are in place before you can give an order like this that has an interaction or a contraindication with some other medication. So it has a huge impact on day-to-day -day patient care as well. Uh, this data is also being utilized uh, very frequently by third-party payers and by insurance companies on utilization management. Uh, this is just an example. WellPoint is a major insurance company in the United States, and typically for pre-authorizations and for utilizations, where it took them 72 hours, even on urgent cases, and about three to five days in elective cases, they started using the IBM Watson model, and now the time to process is within seconds for utilization management. So that's how effective uh, good data is. Again, this is the IBM Watson. This is a cognitive technology. It does learn like a human being. Uh, information is provided by the users and by prior interactions, and it acquires new information and spits out reliable information that you can use. This is just an example uh, for, uh, for uh, good data and, uh, and the future technology. This is what w Watson did. Uh, data from thousands of patients with melanoma and different dermatologic disorders, along with their pictures, were fed into the IBM Watson. Uh, the IBM Watson was then trained to differentiate and distinguish between these conditions. And then this was compared to the best experts in the field, and the accuracy for, of Watson in a prospective fashion was more than 90% in detecting these tumor, uh, in, in these dermatologic conditions versus the other experts who are the true experts in their field. 
So you know, once you train technology, it can do much better. This is how we do our pre present day electronic medical records. Uh, they're predominantly designed to deliver data to point of care. Uh, the problem with this is that most of the times, this data is majority of this is in a text format, and it's not in a format that you can do business analytics or analytics for data or research for, or for any of these things. Uh, so most departments, unfortunately, have to rely on uh, collecting uh, retrospective chart review type of data. And re retrospective data has advantages and disadvantages. I don't think so this audience needs to go into that. Uh, but one of the problems with retrospective data is, is the missing data dictionary. Uh, the other uh, problems with the uh, legacy database is that it's free text. So there are so many important pieces of information. For example, if you can see on the right side of the screen, uh, that is inputted in the form of text. And data analytic tools simply can't analyze uh, these, these formats. And this is some of the other problems with the databases. There's lack of standardized coding. This is how a use of aspirin is coded in a database uh, in Miami. We found there were 12 different ways in which you can input the use of aspirin. Uh, and, and so if you imagine, if you want to find out anything meaningful about the use of aspirin in any condition, see the nightmare that you can face. So anyway, so this is the database that we are focusing on right now. Uh, this is for the prostate fusion biopsy. It is entirely developed uh, because of the generosity of the Vatikuri Foundation. Uh, we are doing a similar work in, in uh, collecting our outcomes in all robotic surgeries and robotic partial nephrectomies, and also in a big kidney cancer database. Uh, again, big data is not always good data. If the source of big data is bad, uh, the data that you get out of it is also bad. Uh, this is an example where uh, 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 it was believed that estrogen was actually much uh, was beneficial in women uh, at a menopausal age, and then it was found out that completely opposite of that was true. Uh, again, I cannot overemphasize the fact that garbage in is garbage out, and good data in is great data out. Uh, so many lives are dependent upon, upon the results of some of these studies that we do that you just simply cannot uh, afford to make mistakes in getting, collecting the right data so that we can process and analyze the right data. Uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I look forward to talking to all of you tomorrow as well. Thank you.